today's session, we're looking deeply in at what's introduced in section 6.4 of the book, a fundamental misconception that sweeps through pretty much all of economics, all of business studies about how the world works whenever anything is coming in that is about random chance, good fortune or bad fortune. And this is something that actually has very, very deep consequences for investors who are using a portfolio approach to investment, for business leaders who are taking decisions about what profit margin is necessary to lead to a certain level of business performance. This fundamental misconception leads to portfolios that fail, business strategies that take the company into the ground, and perhaps Worst of all, it leads to blame games, superficial fudges and fixes that are actually repairing something that is being caused by a fundamental misunderstanding of how the world works. And the, the big fancy technical word for it is whether the world is ergodic or non-ergodic. And we can talk about that a bit more in the moment. So diving into what this means, um, if I were to offer you the following situation, you ha I have a coin, I toss the coin, and if it lands heads, the amount of money you have in your bank account grows by 50%, and if it lands tails, the amount of money you have in your bank account decreases by 40%. You can think of this as a bit like a business proposition. You are selling something to a client and you have a 50-50 probability that the client pays or doesn't pay. If the client pays, your company bank balance grows by 50%. If the client doesn't pay, it decreases by 40%, which was your cost of sale. Do you take the deal? So most people who've taken a statistics course will recognize that those numbers lead to an average 5% growth rate. So if you repeat it often enough, you will win at an average 5% growth rate. So it's economically rational to take that deal. However, as those of you who've read the blog will know, and those of you who know me and the kind of questions I pose, what normal statistics tells you is economically rational is actually false in this situation. If we take a look at what actually happens, this is a simulation of exactly this situation across 100 companies each company starting off at a thousand euros bank balance and tossing that coin 365 times, which represents, let's say, one year of sales cycles, or this could represent 100 companies in a portfolio. <clears throat> the dotted line moving up, let me just make a slight modification. So the dotted line up there is the 5% growth rate that normal statistics says you should expect from a completely balanced coin being tossed at random. Half of them fall heads, half of them fall tails, 50% gain per head, 40% loss per tail. It's 5% benefit on average for every coin toss. That dotted line going up is exactly what you would get if 100 people each tossed the coin once completely separately. 
the lines that you see, the gray lines is coming from a simulation of a hundred companies starting at a thousand. Each company tosses the coin in succession 365 times. And what you see is by the end, 365 times, 92% of the companies have already gone bankrupt. If I were to continue it down to a thousand, pretty much every single company will have gone bankrupt. In this case, the expectation value is this black dosh dat line over here. What this in essence is saying is that in this kind of situation, the normal statistics is fundamentally wrong. If you continue with this gamble for long enough, you will never get to that dotted 5% growth line. You will get closer and closer to this dash dot loss line, which is 5.1% loss per throw on average. The reason behind that is that if things are connected, a different way of calculating needs to be used. Each of these coin tosses is connected across time. What that leads to is that on average 5% loss, not 5% gain. Jackson are talking to in a minute about the fundamentals of what this means for statistics, or at least from the economics perspective. What it means for investors, for example, if you're investing in a portfolio and the numbers look like this, in other words, there's a strong domination from good or bad fortune, you're going to end up losing money across your portfolio when you think you should gain money. Or put a different way, the risk in a portfolio is significantly higher than most people realize using normal statistics because their statistics predicts that dotted line up there, when in reality, it's this dash dot line here that dominates. As I say, the reason behind that is this connection across time. What is also built into here is that if the company hits 10 cents left in their bank account, it goes bankrupt. So there's a, a hard cut off there. The alternative that we have found and that is backed up by some solid recent statistical calculations from 2016, if instead of having a portfolio, you structure as an ecosystem of companies. This is what you get. And the more the companies hang together as an ecosystem, the closer they get to the, the dotted average that you would expect from naive statistics. What's inside this particular simulation is that after every coin toss, the companies that got lucky and grew by 50%, share 1% of their winnings with all of the companies in the ecosystem. So at about 50% win, 50% lose, that means that each company that wins 50% shares on average half a percent of their winning with the companies that didn't win that cycle. And you can see that just that level of collaboration of sharing winnings fundamentally changes the dynamics of an ecosystem of companies. In this case, even the worst company is getting close to the performance of the best company up here. So if we want to have, oh, by the way, that solid red line is the average and the dotted red line over there is the median. This is the middle company the company exactly at number 50 in, in the range is on the dotted line. So the essence of what this shows is that the kind of 
business ecosystem that we're proposing in Rebuild, where all of the companies are incorporated in a way that includes all capitals, all stakeholders, where there is a sharing between all of the companies that are involved with each other of dividends and capital gain, fundamentally transforms the financial performance of the entire group of companies and every single individual companies from the perspective of pure luck. In addition to this comes anything that is actually being done well by the business leaders to drive business performance forwards. This is also pointing at the importance of unconditional basic income and a whole host of other factors. Before we hand over to Jack, I'll put in a couple of other bits of information. So, um, one of the things that comes out of this is that if you are in the kind of processes you've just seen, in order to hit the growth rate or that 5% growth rate that normal stats would predict. In other words, if you want to hit this dotted line up there, using this portfolio approach or as a single company, what you actually need is not the 50% gain per head. You need an 83.8% gain at 40% loss to hit that 5% actual growth rate. So you can see here, businesses who are using the statistical thinking that is taught in business schools and in economics to calculate a rational price point are seriously short in terms of everything that has any measure of luck involved. And this is really important if you think also of the research of Paul Ormerod. Paul Ormerod's work showed that the, the only explanation that really fits business failure is random misfortune, bad luck. All of the other explanations don't fit the data sufficiently well. And that is enough evidence that the role of luck is sufficiently big in business that what we're showing here as a pure luck model has at least some relevance to the decisions that we're taking, whether we're taking them as an investor or as a startup founder or whatever. Um, and the other thing that I was saying, I'm not sure whether you got it, is that if all of the companies are independent as a portfolio, or it's one single company by itself, rather than in a collaborative ecosystem, to get a 5% growth rate, you need to have an 83.8% .8 gain at each winning coin toss, not 50%. And only at that level of profit margin is it rational to take the deal and expect a 5% growth rate. So that's the basis of it. Jack, you want to say a few words about the economics? Um, yeah, I would love to. Uh, I would just like to mention that I'm not involved with CIA, uh, so I don't think I will be disappearing, which is good. Um, I would just like to say welcome to everybody. It's just really, really just deeply, viscerally, uh, very, very exciting just to work with you and to witness and dialogue and all of that. Uh, I will be needing to be leaving a little bit early, and the reason being I'm, I'm actually teaching this stuff that we're criticizing. <laughs> Although, you know, the, the university mandates, well, I have to teach it this way. And um, I will have to be leaving a little bit early. It's early in the morning, and I'm teaching a little bit later. But um, I would also like to just mention that ergodicity is, is if, if, if you're not able to really get I would, I would not be a little bit angry at myself. This is something that is relatively new. And there's a lot of work that we're doing 
and it, we're, we're, we're doing our best to understand uh, the use of this and what it means. And this is almost, in, in my perspective, it's you know, almost a little bit like general relativity. It's very, very critical, although it isn't easy to grasp. And actually, let me give an example. I know Graham um, did a good job of laying it out, but I think this, this might be a simple example. Uh, most of our decisions in life are a gamble, meaning we're, we're doing something, but we don't know exactly you know, what the outcome is or will be, and we don't know specifically what the problem is even going to be. You know, we do this when we go to school, when we're looking, when we're looking for a mate, and even more mundane things, even going out, particularly nowadays. Um, the, the simple example that I would like to give is Russian roulette. And this is not something that I would recommend, and forgive me for using the gun metaphor, but you know, the essence of this game, I guess it is a game, but it is a gamble, is that um, there is a one bullet, and then there's six, chambers and then if you're if you're doing this game with six people which i would not recommend at all then you could you could statistically figure out the odds and the odds are re relatively re reasonable um one bullet six people uh the odds are relatively good and and doing the probability and the expected value you might even get a decision you know go with it particularly if there's money uh, that will be given to the winner. But if an individual does this and does all six, um, the individual will be, will be dead. And I think that's, that really gets at the essence. Uh, what, what ergodicity means is, you know, if we look at the expected value of each person doing um, the Russian roulette with one bullet and uh, uh, six people, the odds are pretty good. But if an individual does that, then the odds are zero that that individual will survive. And what ergodicity means is that if we look at the ensemble, meaning the average uh, of the six people and their probability, that would equal the, the, this average over time of one individual. And that situation, they're obviously not equal. And meaning that situation isn't ergodic, but it's non ergodic. And the difference is that, you know, we live in time and this is the way we operate. And even given us this average probability that there's one in six. Really, it really doesn't matter that much with the individual. You know, if the individual is going over this over time, it's very, very different um, situation. And the, the difficulty, as uh, Graham mentioned, and it is a misconception, but this misconception is deeply rooted. And it's so deeply rooted that. Um, most of us aren't even aware of it. In the last couple of weeks, I've been doing some research in economics books, and then uh, also a lot of other writings, and there isn't any mention of this in most economics books. You know, we're actually teaching this um, as if, as if uh, there is no difference, and there is a significant difference. In most situations in life, are not ergodic, but we're we're in economics at basic finance. We're teaching as if they are ergodic, and I think the best way to at least for me uh, to keep this um, this distinguishing um, aspect of this is Russian Russian roulette, and that's a basic idea which could be extended. Um, elsewhere. Just briefly, the essence of the book Rebuild, as a reminder for those who've been in the previous webinars and as an 
brief summary for those who haven't, the focus or one focus of the book Rebuild is how do you build business ecosystems that are inherently designed to sit at the sweet spot that nature lives at between collaboration and competition. Many of you will already have come across this axis going up there, which is the axis of how work is organized. Things like holacracy, sociocracy sit over there. And we, in this book, show how it's necessary to actually go beyond what they can do to a point where the company itself is able to create new companies or decide to end its own life, etc. For that to work well, it needs to be integrated with human processes, things like Keegan's deliberately developmental organization or our extension of that that we call the Evolute 6 adaptive way. And again, there it's necessary to get companies to the point level five where development is a core purpose of the company. And the third axis, which is how the company is incorporated. In other words, how it brings in the stakeholders and how it harnesses the tension between stakeholders and between the different capitals as a source of strength and growth for the company. And what we show clearly in the book is that if you want to have psychological safety at work, if you want to have self-management at work, you cannot do it in any thing other than a highly fragile way if you're incorporated as a limited company. A cooperative is pretty much the bare minimum, but if you really want to get the benefits that we're talking about here of this kind of whole ecosystem growth and the anti-fragility that every single company in the ecosystem here displays against misfortune, then you need to actually have an incorporation that goes all the way up to what we call level five. And at the level five incorporation, all of the other companies in the ecosystem have an appropriate level of legally anchored and protected governance rights in each other and a share of the wealth generated by each other company at an appropriate level. They can trust each other over the long term as an ecosystem because each has governance rights in the other company. So the trust is not based on relatively fragile contracts that where you don't have much actual involvement in what's happening. The trust is based on the fact that everybody is actually part of everybody else's general meeting governance decisions. That leads to what I call a deep ecosystem rather than a shallow ecosystem or even worse, a portfolio. So that's the essence behind everything. 